update on what we were, what our goal was. We were contacted in, in the summer of 2014 uh, by Mary sort of to think about a follow-up, <coughs> excuse me, a follow-up study to the study that we had conducted two years ago, uh, looking at the differences in, in uh, demographic makeup and test scores between the French and the English programs. So what we looked at were, in, in fall of 2015, Avery and I conducted two essentially separate studies. Uh, the first one we refer to as a cross-sectional study. And what we did was look at test scores for grade three students, grade four students, and grade five students uh, from their, using their MCAS 2014 data. So they were in third, fourth, and fifth grade during the 2013-2014 school year. So that's sort of cross-sectional, meaning it just takes one cross-section of, of the test scores. The second analysis that we did was what we called our cohort analysis. And what we did was take data from kids who are in seventh grade, currently in seventh grade. So they're in seventh grade right now in the 14-15 school year. Um, is that right? 14-15 mm -hmm. school year. And then we looked at test score data from them for prior years. So their fifth grade data, sorry, their sixth grade data, fifth grade data, fourth grade data, and third grade data. So we went back the way and we were looking at patterns. So it's basically two different ways of slicing up the data so that we can get a better um, understanding of the patterns that we see between, excuse me, <coughs> between the French and the English programs. Okay. And that just just to, to be clear, there is a report that corresponds to this these slides, and on each of the slides, we do provide the page number of the report so that you can go and see more information, because there's a lot more information in the report than we present here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start first with the cross-sectional analysis. So we uh, looked at demographics and MCAS data for students in grades 3, grade 4, and grade 5. Um, in the 2013-2014 school year. Right? This is our cross-sectional analysis. And what we found was that at all grades, right, grades 3, 4, and 5, uh, the French immersion program had fewer students who were low income, fewer students who were minority, at some grades fewer students who were male, and fewer students who, were, who had sped classification um, than the, fr the English program. All right. Um, one other point was that if w if we compared the the types of special education classifications across the two programs, we found that um, students with sped classifications who were in the French immersion program tended to have less severe; they were more in inclusive uh, um, designations than some of the students in the in the English program. Um, and one point that's important to note as we move forward through these analyses, that some of our comparisons are compromised because the sample sizes are very small. So they're compromised not only in their generalizability to other students, but also in their ability statistically to work for us, to be able to detect differences when differences occur. Uh, so I do point that out when it becomes a challenge, but as an example, uh, grade three, there were only 10 special education students in the French immersion program. So just bear that in mind that, that sample size is an issue, and I do point it out when we need to. Okay. So first thing to look at will be the demographics. Um, so if we compare the French and the English programs in terms of percent low income, percent minority, Right. Percent low income, percent minority, percent male, and per percent of students with special education classifications, you see that there are differences be between the two. So for example, if we look there at third grade, right? so in the French immersion program, you've approximately 3% of students are um, classified as low income or have low income designations in the French program, compared to about 20% in the English program. So if we look at the next one, minority status. Right. So there were about 10% minority in the French immersion program compared to about 37% minority in the English program. Right. 
We're seeing more similar in terms of genders, the breakdown in genders, but for grades three and grade five, we are seeing that there are more males in the English program than in the French program. Grade four is the exception there for last year. And then for special education classifications, we're also seeing a difference. Now, some of the difference, for example, in special education classifications, you, you would expect to see because it is one of those classifications that can lead to disparities in ability to, for example, learn through a different language. So that something like uh, gender minority status and low income status would, would not be in the same type of characteristic in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at each of these, um, we did find, oops, I'm sorry, we did find that there was a statistically significant difference between the percentages. Right. So in each of these, there were differences. Right. Now, I think if, if you remember the last time I was here, we did talk about some of the, the differences that are measured and unmeasured between different types of programs. So because these are not, because students are not randomly assigned to be in the French or the English program, you're going to get self-selection issues you're going to have everything that's associated with those self-selection issues. So not just demographic characteristics, but other things that are correlated perhaps with demographic characteristics or not. Right. So one of the things that we would try to do eventually here, and this is what we talk about, is try to think about um, controlling statistically for some of these demographic differences. But it's clear from the outset that the, the two programs have quite different breakdowns of student demographics. Right. So the next thing that I'm going to look at are the average scale scores in English language arts and math. Right. And what we see here is that at, at grades three, four, and five, you are seeing, without taking anything else into account, you are seeing a statistically significant difference between average scores in the English program and average scores in the French program with the French program having statistically significantly higher scores. And what you're seeing over in the column on the right is what we call a, a standardized difference. And it basically takes the average difference between the two. Right? So for example, for grade three, we have an average difference of uh, 5.84 points for English language arts. And what we can do is figure out, well, how big is that on the scale of the MCAS that goes from 200 to 280 and has a standard deviation, for example, uh, somewhere between 11 and 15, approximately for third grade. So we do a calculation and we calculate this, this value right here, which for third grade English language arts comes out to be 0.43 of a standard deviation. Um, and 0.43 of a standard deviation is not a small amount. Right? It's actually almost half a standard deviation difference. And when we, we think about federal guidelines that you know, the federal government, when they fund research, they say, well, what's educationally important? They say that effect sizes or standardized differences of about 0.25 or above are things that are worthy of investing money in. And the idea is sort of the opposite here is that you're finding this difference that is large. Okay? So, if we, if we conclude here, the conclusion would be that the French immersion <coughs> scores are statistically significantly higher than the English scores. However, these are what we call unconditional comparisons. We're just doing a straight up comparison between French and English. And it's not really valid in this case because as you saw by the slides before this, they are very different demographically. And Yes, they're different demographically. We can see that they are also likely to be different on other unmeasured things, um, beliefs, attitude, peer influences, and these kinds of things that are, are completely unmeasured here. Okay. So one of the things that you would want to do in trying to figure out whether there really is a difference between the French and the English programs is to take into account these demographic differences. And there are a number of different ways that we could do that. And we talk about two here. And there's another one that Avery and I have talked with Superintendent Gormley about pursuing next. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first sort of quick and dirty ways to do this would be doing a simple matching analysis. 
So what we did was create students that were similar to each other, who were in the French and the English program. And the easiest way to do this um, was to essentially control or hold constant on race. So we had ended up with four different comparisons that we were interested in. So what we did was take non-minority boys who were not sped and not low income, right? and within that group compared the English and the French. And then we had minority boys who were not sped and not low income, again comparing the English and the French here. And then we did the same for non-minority girls who were not sped and not low income, and then non-minority girls who, I'm sorry, minority girls who were not sped and not low income. Right. So this is just a way of holding constant through matching some of the differences in demographics that we saw. And now once we have the students matched, <coughs> excuse me, now we can compare their test scores. So now if you look to the next slide, what we see here is the comparison <coughs> where we have a matching analysis done with non-minority boys who are not sped and not low, low income in the French and the English programs. And we have it for English language arts and we have it for math for grades three, four, and five. So what you're seeing here is that, well, it's tough to see because they actually are on top of each other, that non-minority boys who are not sped and not low income score almost the exact same as each other, regardless of, well, in the French and the English program. Right. So they're, they're identical to each other. So just to, to give you a sense, um, for the English language arts, the English score, um, the, the average MCAS English language arts score for the English students was 248.93. And in the French immersion, for this same group, it was 248.24. So once we matched, there was no difference between the two. Okay. Um, so one of the challenges in this type of matching analysis is that we run into issues with small sample sizes. So if you remember back from the first, oops, if you remember back from the first slide, or the first couple of slides where I said that there were small numbers of for example, low income minority boys in one program versus another. So what we see are situations where it's difficult to make st both statistical decisions as well as decisions that are generalizable because our sample sizes are so small. So right here in our English language arts, if we're comparing the English to the French, right here for minority boys who are not sped and not low income, we're talking about nine students in the English program and only two students in the French program. So we're seeing differences here, but not only can we not talk about them statistically, but really there's so much error when you're talking about two students that it's really not worth it. And just to let me go back to the slide before for one second, to just give you a sense of the numbers here. So for the third grade analysis here, we're talking about 28 students, 28 non-minority boys who are not sped and not low income in English, compared to 51 in the French immersion. So there are much larger numbers here. So we can be much more confident in seeing the lack of discrepancy here than we are in seeing these tiny discrepancies here. They're, they're small, they're not statistically significant, but they're not statistically significant because the sample size is so small, right? But the difference that you're seeing, we can't really be confident in it anyway. So if we look at the next one, again, we're going back to our larger numbers again now because we have non-minority girls who are not sped and not low income. So we're talking about 25 students in the English program and 70 students in the French immersion program. So again, we were able to have more confidence in our comparisons here and say that these would be representing what, what it really is like. <clears throat> and you're seeing right here, except for fourth grade in math, right, you're seeing almost identical overlap between the two. And in cases where there is a difference, the English has higher mean scores than the French. Right? So non-minority girls who are not sped and not low income, right, will be doing just as well 
or in the case of math in the fourth grade, doing significantly better than non-minority girls who are not SPED and not low income in the English program. Not, I'm sorry, not low income in the French program. Okay, sorry about that. It's a lot to keep track of. Okay. So then our last group that we were comparing uh, was minority girls who are not SPED and not low income. We're back here now to this situation where we've got very small sample sizes, 10 students in the English program and seven students in the French program. And we're back to not having a huge amount of confidence in these comparisons. So sort of to our takeaway message then from this section of this type of analysis that we did was that with, you know, with one exception, which was the fourth grade in, um, in mathematics, um, all else being equal, students with similar demographic characteristics had similar MCAS scores regardless of the program that they're in. Okay, so the other way that we can conduct this type of analysis where we're statistically controlling for rather than manually matching, which is what we just presented, is to, to con construct a statistical model which we call our, um, a multiple regression model. So what we do is we take a, our dependent variable, which in this case would be our MCAS score, and we predict the difference between the students in the French and the English program. We predict the difference in their MCAS score after controlling for demographic characteristics. So this allows us to see whether after controlling for multiple demographic characteristics, we can see whether there is a statistically significant difference between the average score in the English program and the average score in the French program. So when we conducted this analysis or constructed the statistical model, we found that the differences in the demographic characteristics explain away, when they're combined together, they explain away all of the difference in test scores between the English and the French program. Meaning that after controlling for low income status, minority status, special education status, and gender. There was no statistically significant difference between scores, English language art scores, and math scores right, for the French and the English programs at grades three or grade four or grade five. Right, there were no differences. So one of the things that Avery and I are doing is tag teaming this. So in addition to uh, talking about these MCAS scores and demographics, there's another metric that Avery is going to speak about as well as another issue. So I'll hand you over. So something else we looked at is student growth percentiles. Um, just to give a very general overview as to what they are, they represent the relative growth made by students as compared to others at the same score level in the previous year. Um, a good way of thinking about this is like a pediatrician's height and weight chart, um, seeing growth trends um, year to year. Uh, we use them for a couple reasons. The state actually provides this information. Um, first of all, they're inclusive. They measure growth for students at all ability levels, ranging from um, needs improvement all the way up through advanced. Um, and significantly, it provides evidence of improvement among low achievers um, because of that. Uh, additionally, they complement proficiency information um, to help paint a broader picture of performance, which is part of the reason that we're incorporating them in this presentation. So overall, SGPs are a useful measure when looking at relative student growth, um, but they can get complicated because of their statistical properties, and we can't look at things like averages as we can with the previous data um, that Dr. O'Dwyer just discussed. So instead, we use median, um, median SGPs, where um, the 50th percentile is the statewide mean, and anything between the 40th and the 60th percentile is considered typical growth. Um, so as you're going through the report and as I'm talking about some of the numbers here, that's kind of a, a guideline. So in our analysis, we calculated SGPs for fourth and fifth grade. It's unava unavailable for third grade because third grade is the, the first year of testing, so there's only one year of data. Um, we found no statistically significant differences here except for fifth grade ELA, 
Um, and here, the English student's median SGP was in the 68th percentile, which is higher um, as compared to the French student's SGP, which was the 54.5th percentile. Um, and just to give you just one more piece of information here, so according to the state, um, any difference greater than 10 percentile points is deemed to be educationally significant. Um, we're going to have some variation in the SGPs in the report just because of small ends. Um, so you might see some differences larger than 10 points, but if you see something that's both statistically significant and greater than 10 points, you can term it both statistically and practically significant. So that's something to, to look out for. Um, something else we did um, is we split our two-group English versus French analysis into a three-group analysis based on when students entered the district. This was at the suggestion of um, Superintendent Gormley and her team. Um, in this way, we could break out the scores to examine if score differences might be related um, in, to late entry into Milton Public Schools. So uh, we separated English students into two groups. Uh, so we have those who've been in Milton Public Schools since prior to first grade, and then those who have entered after first grade. Um, we did this because the French um, immersion classification is determined at first grade. So the analyses that we conducted here, um, we found very similar results to those that Dr. O'Dwyer just reported. Uh, some key highlights to go over. Um, first of all, there are some demographic differences, and it's imp particularly important to note the high percentage of both minority and low-income students in this third group, the post-first grade um, entrance into Milton Public Schools. Uh, we also found that French students tended to achieve the highest MCAS scores for both ELA and math, but that's without accounting for any demographic differences. That's just the same overall trend that we saw before. But after accounting for low income status, minority status, gender, and SPED status in a multiple regression model, we did find, that once again, no statistically significant differences in MCAS scores across these three groups um, for either ELA or math. Uh, finally, we found that SGPs were generally highest in the English post first grade group. So the next piece that we want to talk about is the, <coughs> excuse me, the cohort analysis. Now, just to remind you, the, the one that we just talked about was grades three, four, and five uh, during the 2013-2014 school year. And now this is going back a year, right? So it's going back a year. So now it would be grade three, right? Actually, I believe I have it right here. I can put it up. So. <coughs> These would, uh, we ha would have their, their data from their 2010-2011 grade 3 all the way up to their 2013-2014 grade 6. Now, one thing to point out here is that uh, MCAS does not have what we call a vertical scale. So you can't grow from a third grader to a sixth grader. They are discrete tests that have their own properties and were never meant to be linked. So we have to be very careful not to talk about scro scores growing over time. The only thing that we can do is compare the French and the English or any analyses that we do within each grade and look at patterns <coughs> across each of the five, t four time points. Mm -hmm. So that's just our, our, our warning here not to draw any growth conclusions from the scale. So what we see here is, uh, with the exception of gender, there were statistically significant differences between the percentages of students from different subgroups in the French and the English programs. So I'm just going to go forward a little bit. So um, this is the same information that was presented in the bar charts earlier. So what you're seeing here are the percentage of low income percent minority, uh, percent male and percent special education students. And the stars on the side indicate that the percentages are statistically significantly different from each other. So for example, there are five low-income students that makes up 3.7% compared to 45 or 26.2% in the 2011 grade three cohort. Right. 
what you'll also see here is that there are differences in numbers over time. And this is partly because of, of what Avery mentioned about students moving into the district and some students would be moving out. And it's also to do with reclassification. So classification will change for SPED. It may change for low income. Okay, so you're seeing some, some movement in the numbers. So what we found in all years, so going back from the 2010-2011 school year, is that uh, the French Immersion Program had fewer low income, uh, fewer minority students, and fewer special education students than the French program. So this is similar to what we saw in the 2013-2014 cohort analysis that we did, or cross-sectional analysis that we did. Um, something else to, to point out is that students entering the Milton Public Schools after the first grade um, were are automatically assigned to be in the English program. And they tend to be coming into Milton Public Schools with demographics that are slightly more homogeneous, right? meaning that they tend to be lower income lower income groups and tend to be minority groups. So what you're seeing here are, the, are some numbers. We don't really do anything with these numbers. We're just pointing out to you that some students do enter, so it's not a constant set of students across all the years. So when you see here that uh, six, or, sorry, 25 students entered, uh, what, what we're saying is that um, 25 students entered between first grade and third grade, right? Um, another five students entered uh, in the in fourth grade, another 16 students entered in fifth grade, and then 21 students entered in sixth grade. So they're more likely to be low income, minority, and male compared to students in the French program or in the English program who had been in Milton public schools since first grade or before. When we looked at the, the SPED classifications, according to the students coming in versus the students who were there, we didn't see any discernible differences. So it wasn't like they were more likely to have higher levels of uh, special education classifications or severity of classifications. So we go back now to look at our unconditional or or uncontrolled for or unadjusted differences between the French and the English programs. And what we see here is that there is a, a statistically significant difference between average English language arts and mathematics scores for students in the French and the English programs. So we have the numbers here in the table. You can see that the the standardized difference in the column to the right appears to be getting bigger over time. So it's 0.44 and it goes all the way up to 0.76. Okay. So I've displayed this graphically. And not to confuse you with the lines, remember this does not imply growth over time. But what we're seeing here is that for this particular cohort of students who were in third grade in the 2010-2011 school year and are now in seventh grade, so they had sixth grade scores, that the gap between the French and the English program appeared to increase over time. But remember that this is unadjusted for there are no adjustments made here for the fact that the student makeup is qualitatively different in the French and the English programs. We're seeing a similar thing here for math, where we're seeing the gap widen. Okay. Again, it's just for this cohort of students. And again, it's unadjusted. So we did not do a matching comparison here. But what we did do was our multiple regression analysis. So out of the three ways that we could possibly do this, we did two with the first set of data. And we did one here. And it's the one that's used most frequently. And it's the multiple regression approach. So in each year, we constructed a multiple regression model where we looked at the predicted difference between the French and the English programs on their English language art scores separately for them from their math scores 
and we looked to see if the difference was statistically significant after controlling for um, demographic characteristics, low income status, minority status, gender, and special education classifications. So what we found was for grades three and four, after controlling for the difference, sorry, controlling for the demographic characteristics of the students, there was no statistically significant difference remaining between the French and the English programs. However, for the fifth and sixth grade, we did find that for both subjects, English language arts and math, we did find that a statistically significant difference remained after we controlled for, um, after we controlled for these demographic characteristics. Now, one point, a couple of points to, to remember here. This is just one cohort of students coming all the way through. In order to be sure that a gap is widening at the higher grades, one would have to look at multiple cohorts of students to see if this is the case. Now, we're lucky that we did the cross-sectional analysis because we actually have another fifth grade here that we can compare this to. So if you remember back a few slides, I said at the fifth grade, the fifth grade uh, for the 2013-2014 year, which was last year, right, there was no statistically significant difference between the English and the French programs after controlling for demographic characteristics. Whereas for the fifth grade here, okay, which was the 2012-2013 school year, there was a statistically significant difference. So this is kind of inconclusive. Okay? So for the third and fourth grades, we're seeing that when we did the cross-sectional data, right, with the 2013-2014 with the school year, we're seeing no significant difference. And we're seeing no significant difference here. So we have more compelling evidence that there is no difference at these lower grades. For fifth grade, it's a little bit mixed in that we have one cohort where there, a difference remains after controlling for the demographic characteristics, and another cohort where it, it is not significant after controlling for demographic characteristics. We don't have any other sixth grade data to compare uh, this one difference we have at sixth grade. So as sort of our, our takeaway message here is that um, um, some differences did remain, but we can't definitively conclude that it is increasing over time. We have some mixed results that perhaps if we look at another couple of cohorts of data that we may be able to resolve and say that, well, this is the anomalous year in the 2012-2013 school year. It was unusual for us to have found a difference in the fifth grade and subsequently the sixth, sixth grade. <coughs> so I want to pass over to Avery now to talk again about the student growth percentiles. So in looking at the student growth percentiles in the cohort analysis, we were able to calculate um, an ELA in math for grades four, five, and six this time around. We found there were no statistically significant differences in SGPs between students in the French and English program with the one exception of grade six ELA where it was uh, 56th percentile for French students and 41st percentile for English. When the English students were broken out into pre-first grade and post-first grade groups, like the three, groups, three group analysis that we discussed before, our analysis revealed that French students demonstrated a statistically significantly higher median SGP than English students who have been in MPS since first grade. Again, it's the 56th percentile versus the 41st percentile. Since these percentile comparisons are the same, it might be reasonable to conclude that we couldn't accurately compare the French and the post first grade English group due to small ends. Um, so there could be a statistically significant difference, but that number was perhaps too small to make any reasonable uh, claim about the differences there. Um, it's also worth noting that the French group here has the higher student growth percentile, whereas in our first analysis, the English group had the higher student growth percentile. <coughs> so when looking at the three group analysis, we already discussed most of these differences, so I'm just going to reiterate a couple of the key points here. So. Regarding, regarding demographics, uh, the same as with our first analysis, we noticed demographic differences across the three groups, 
most notably in the low income and minority populations in the uh, students who were entering MPS after first grade. Uh, we also found differences in males here, although they weren't quite as prominent. <coughs> Um, after accounting for low income, well, first of all, at all grades when broken out by length of time in MPS, French immersion students sc scored significantly higher than English students who had been in Milton since first grade and English students who had been in Milton um, who, who entered after first grade. But once again, after accounting for low income status, minority status, gender, and SPED status in the multiple regression model that she just discussed, we found no statistically significant differences in MCAS scores. Uh, in both subjects uh, in the lower grades, three and four, um, but we did find some differences, statistically significant differences in both subjects for grades five and six. So with that said, I'll turn it back for our takeaway. Thank you. Thanks, Avery. Mm -hmm. okay. So if we think about what the patterns that we've observed across the different analyses that we did, um, both descriptive analyses as well as inferential analyses where we conducted um, analysis of variance and we conducted multiple regression analyses and t-tests and all of these other things. Um, our, our takeaway from all of these analyses would be that there appear to be quite large differences in the demographic makeup or breakdown of the, the student bodies in the French and the English program. And when there also does seem to be score differences. So if somebody were to look just at score differences without knowing about the differences in demographic backgrounds, then there may be, one may draw, jump to the erroneous conclusion that there are differences between the two programs in their scores. But the data that we're presenting appears to suggest that that is not the case. That for the most part, with a couple of small exceptions, we did find that once you took uh, to statistically controlled for or matched on demographic characteristics, the difference between the French and the English programs was went away, basically. Right. So at third and fourth grade, we have we had two sets of third grades that we analyzed, two sets of fourth grades that we analyzed, and in both of them we found that there was no statistically significant difference between the, the, the two, between the, the English program and the French program. At the fifth grade we also looked at two cohorts, but it was a little bit less conclusive. I think one would have to look at more cohorts in order to be able to see whether the difference is disappearing or is getting bigger um, at the upper grades. And again, the same thing with, with the sixth grade. So we had some slightly inconsistent results, particularly with the multiple regression, less so with the matching analysis. Um, our small sample sizes were created some challenges, ch challenges for us in terms of generalizability and conducting statistical significance tests for some groups with our matching, so we were, we were compromised here. So that is the end of our formal presentation. Um, I d have not talked about some of the things that may be possible for you to consider based on this, and I don't know if, if we have a warrant to make a, a, a couple of suggestions about this. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Um, I think that it may be worthwhile for the leadership team to think about, for the district leadership team, I should say, to, to think about ways to improve outreach and communication with all groups in, of citizens and demogra demographic characteristics in the town. Um, <clears throat> so that there is less of a difference, there are fewer differences between the programs in terms of demographics. Um, I would expect perhaps that the difference in special education percentages may remain, but perhaps for the other ones, some of the outreach might go toward ameliorating some of the peer effects that go on where individuals will tend to group together and 
be in the same program. Um, from my experience in conducting educational studies, I would not be concerned that there is a big difference between scores in the French and the English program, or that one program is better or worse than the other, um, because the data doesn't allow us, first of all, to conclude without a doubt because it's not an experiment. People aren't randomly assigned to, to one program or the other. But based on the observational evidence that we have across multiple cohorts, multiple different types of analyses, it really is suggesting that these differences are small, if anything, and largely due to demographic differences between the two. So if there was a way through outreach to improve the um, uh, prepare families to better understand both programs, then there might be more of a, an informed choice being made, and that might end up evening up the demographic characteristics. And that is the end of our mm -hmm. presentation. Thank you. Questions? Thoughts? It's done in silence. Ms. Kelly? Um, thank you very much for doing this. I'm sure it took loads and loads of time. So we had mentioned at the beginning that there might be another method to pursue in terms of analysis. Mm -hmm. Did you mention that? And I apologize if I know I did, but okay. Could you elaborate on yeah, that? Yeah, there, there is a there is a procedure called propensity score matching where this kind of crude matching that I did in here, which is like a, a forced matching, where I just took non-minority boys were not sped and not low income and basically compared to the two. Well, there's, there's a slightly more, um, well, it's a lot more sophisticated way of doing that where you're basically statistically controlling for the propensity for an individual to, to choose to be in one group versus another. So, for example, you would have an individual who is low income and minority, judging by these data, would have a lower propensity for being in the French program. But there are minority low-income students in the French program. So what we do is create a counterfactual statistically and control for that. So that's one of the next things. Avery and I spoke about it today, that that would be one of the next things that we would um, uh, conduct. And it would just add to this body of evidence. It's just another piece without an experiment, <coughs> which obviously it is not possible and would never be possible with something like this. It's, we, we gather evidence from multiple sources so that we can triangulate results. And it would just be another, say, leg on this triangle. Okay. So, so just if I can, so that's sort of um, making the, the, the comparison of, of students smaller, is that, am I understanding? Kind of cleaner, okay. in a way. Um, in, in terms of the matching. In terms of the matching. One of the challenges, though, with any analysis that we're doing here, and I, I mentioned this briefly earlier, is that we can only match on things that, we, that have been measured. So there are going to be beliefs, attitudes, peer influences wrapped up and perhaps correlated with demographics, but we don't know because we haven't measured them. In an ideal world, you would have all of these measures and you'd be able to, to match on their propensity on all of these background measures. So we will only be able to match on the demographic characteristics that we have. And, and so you, you have a suggestion as to um, how to uh, reach out to the community to sort of get more representation in the French immersion program. And the reason that you think that's important is well, I think if you were to, to think about the defensibility of having a program, you would want to be able to say that, you know, in a, in a publicly funded school that you're providing equal schooling. And it's, it's highly suggested by these analyses that that is actually the case. However, when you look at the raw differences between the, on the MCAS scores, anybody who isn't here this evening 
or doesn't read the report that will be posted may jump to the false conclusion that there is a difference between the two programs when actually there may not be. So one of the ways to ensure that you are doing justice to every student would be to make sure that both programs are serving similar types of students. Right? So there, there are other issues that are there other points that would be related to that where it may be a, um, a self-selecting that is influenced strongly by peer influences which may or may not be healthy. Uh, I'm not sure. So you just <coughs> want to make sure that any time that the reports are going out about comparisons between the two programs that you're, you can say that it doesn't matter which one people choose. Students are doing as well in them and you will have a much stronger argument to be able to conclude that without all of these statistical shenanigans here if they are demographically equivalent or approximately equivalent. And if you think about some of these unmeasured variables that we're talking about, one way to potentially target those is through outreach. Um, if you think of one of these variables as um, information access, for example, then through outreach you can potentially target that and then reduce variation between the programs that way. It's just another way of thinking about it. Thank you very much. Um, it's very interesting. I do think um, what's that somewhat at a loss is that, um, you know, at the last time you came, we, it was shortly after that, I mean, not necessarily because of your presentation, but shortly after that we did do a cap. Mm -hmm. And the first and second grade classes, although I don't know if they're necessarily more diverse, the demographics has changed, at least there's larger numbers in the English um, classes and it, we would might be able to do more analysis later. But I think um, in terms of your outreach, I agree with that. I think that there's something being missing for if you have a very low diversity in one group and much more. I think part of education just isn't about your educational program but about the other students you're with and learning from them and learning from different learning styles and I think when you lose that you're losing something in your educational program so I think that is something we really need to tackle. Um, it's great that, that in the classroom I think we're doing a great job in both programs but in terms of getting students around um, in a diverse group we're somewhat need to work on how to encourage those programs to be more similar. I would say the only thing I wonder about, especially because there's a lot of talk lately about looking at other ways to measure besides we just have this one tool, the MCAS testing, is what other things we might be able to look at in terms of even um, we're starting to look at social, social emotional behavior surveys and things like that. Um, in terms of rigor and um, resilience in students and how they react because I think some of this is um, some of what's kind of gone on in the culture of Milton Public Schools is the attitude towards different programs and so I'd really like to tackle that in a way but I don't know if you have any experience with <coughs> different measuring tools other than standardized testing to look at how kids are behaving and responding in classrooms. Yeah. I think that's a really important point and in fact, Avery, this is something that, that Avery is very interested in, so these non-cognitive measures. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side of the argument that you're on, that standardized test scores are, you know, the coin of the realm. They are yep. the currency that everybody uses, that, that districts use to meet state and federal mandates. So I don't expect that they will go away anytime soon. Um, but I do agree with you that there are these other correlated indicators of success and I think that it is certainly within Milton Public Schools purview and ability or capacity to administer any kind of non-cognitive measure and they could you could begin to build this up over time mm -hmm. it could just become part of your regular testing um, and it might be that uh, there's a September version and, and a June version or it could just be a once a year thing. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for um, growth between the French and the English in perhaps um, attitudinal um, work habits, these kinds of things. 
And again, it's just another piece of evidence beyond test scores in comparing the two programs. So I would, I would fully agree. And I would be happy to help the, well, we would be happy to help um, <coughs> Milton Public Schools think about those types of non-cognitive measures that you would value yeah. and then subsequently help you to find measures because that, that would be the best thing to do. There are pre-existing measures which have good psychometric properties. They are providing consistent results and they're telling you something that is truthful and honest about the, the, the behavior or attitude that you want to measure. And I think in addition to that, you don't have to wait till third grade and then wait another year to, you know, you know to measure. You, if you're changing something or trying something new, you can't wait three nope. years to see if it's working. So um, I would I would <coughs> love to get some help on some guidance on that because I think that you know um, it could make a real difference and and have immediate results. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you, um, uh, Dr. O'Dwyer, and, and soon to be Dr. Newton. We've, uh, in the district over the last two years, have devoted a lot of re resources to closing uh, what we've defined as achievement gaps along minority status, uh, low income status, and special mm -hmm. education. And is it fair for us to infer that if we succeed in closing those gaps, we will, as a byproduct of that, succeed in closing the gap between the French and, and French and English programs yes. for MCAS, MCAS yes. scores? It, it's sort of the, the inverse of the, the question that, that Mary asked. Uh, if you close the gaps, you can close the gaps between the two programs by having similar types of students of different characteristics in the, in the two programs. But ultimately, what you really want to do, which is what you suggest, is to close the gaps completely, and then it doesn't make any difference. Um, but that is a national, major national issue. It's not just something that Milton Public Schools is facing. Um, yeah. So, uh, actually, on that point, for that to occur, you, you would expect to see, or you would need to generate student growth percentiles that are higher among the subgroups that are experiencing or demonstrating the achievement gap than among the uh, other control group. Correct. Correct? Correct. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what to conclude about whether this um, comments on that particular point at all. Mm -hmm. Well, can you talk about the, the growth for kids who come in after English. Now, we, we did not look at that specifically. We didn't look at that specifically um, because some of our sample sizes are very small. So, for example, if you were looking at um, minority and non-minority students in the French program to see what, whether their growth, right? So, uh, let's say minority students in the French program and minority students in the English program. You've got small numbers. So, again, when we look at the growth in the two, right, then we're going to be compromised because, or any conclusions that we would have would be affected by lack of generalizability in small sample sizes. There was, there was one piece of evidence that Avery mentioned. Yes, yeah, so I want to point out. Sorry, so I'm looking through the report right now. Um, so if you look at the, in the cohort section for the students entering after first grade, the student growth percentiles range from 47, that's the only one below 50, all the way up to 78.5, which based on the guideline of 40 to 60 is pretty huge. Um, so that could be due to a lot of things. It could be a statistical anomaly, from some kind of fluctuation. Uh, it could be due to unusually low growth in the previous year, and then you just happen to score on par where you're supposed to be this year. Um, or it could be uh, what you'd hope it would be, is that once they come to Milton, they have the resources that they need, and they're able to score higher compared to how they had done the previous year in another district or in their first couple years in this district. Um, there are probably a couple other possibilities. Those just seem like some of the key um, options. And, uh, and again, you, you, would, you would hope and, and maybe with a little bit more data, would be, we would be able to 
more uh, reasonably um, or confidently conclude that once they come into Milton, their, their access to the resources here has enabled them to grow unusually high compared to the other students mm -hmm. who have been here for longer in, other, in the French and English program alike. So if I look at the, um, the data in the grade seven cohort findings, this is table G7.9, it would appear that the, uh, if I look at the mean scores, uh, it would appear that the achievement gap is even greater in French than it is in English uh, between minorities and whites. What Sorry, it's too you small for us for zooming in. I'm on page 15. It's not on the slides. I'm, in the, I'm actually in the ex executive summary that, that we got. You said G7.9, that's the table you're looking Correct. at? Correct. Descriptive statistics for math scale scores by minority status. Yes. It's not the full So grade. which grade? So if I look um, grade by grade, if I look at the, the difference in mean scores for minorities in um, four different things. <coughs> English, I'm sorry, minorities and whites in English, um, the gap is about seven points between, this is 2011, grade three. Yep. Uh, for French, it's about 10 points. Yep. 2012, grade four. For English, it's about seven, seven points. points. Uh, yep. For French, it's about 12 points. And that trend continues. Yep. So I, I thought that was interesting, but I, I don't know um, what, if anything, that tells us, except that it appears that the achievement gap is it's larger in the French program than it is in English. It's smaller in the English than it Correct. is in the French. Correct. Um, there are some differences in sample sizes there. Uh, we did not test that difference. We did not look at the, the achievement gap in that way within each. I don't believe we did. Mm -mm. It's a long report. <laughs> and was added to continuously during the fall. Um, but it does look, with that, with that data that you're just pointing to, it does appear to be this, the case for the grade three, four, and five, grade three, four, five, and six cohort. It would be interesting to look at the same analysis for the third, fourth, and fifth grade, mm -hmm. which is also in this report. Yep. We just didn't pull it out in that way to, to look at it. Can you scan to that? So here we have two, four, two, three. We're just looking at page four points and about six points. Four points and six points at grade three for low income or no for minority and not minority. So that's third grade. So there's that's the same same trend. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Eight points. Oh, that's a huge one. Too. Eight points versus eleven. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that is that we we didn't pull it out this way in particular. Uh, we can certainly go back and think about the data that way and do comparisons that way. We were more concerned with comparing the English and the French and thinking about the, the demographics in there rather than seeing whether one did a better job than another closing a gap right. between well, subgroups. Well, I'd be interested in that, uh, yeah. particularly because that's our focus. I mean, this is great news. And as you said, I think it, if there is a myth, it dispels the myth that, that there are dramatic differences between the two programs. Mm -hmm. but. You know, our, our challenge right now is closing the achievement gap. And right. the more data we can generate on that, that, that informs that discussion, the better. Um, also, I'd be interested in any comparisons. You, you talked earlier in the presentation about um, looking at uh, minority, not SPID, not low income, and non-minority, not SPID, not low income. Whatever comparisons you can offer on that would be interesting as well. Okay. So we can certainly, it, it's all in there. Mm -hmm. It's all in the report. We would just have to reframe 
in addition to mm -hmm. to that to to put in some parts of it we'd be happy to do that and my last question is actually a compliment and then a question and the compliment is that that uh, we are um, greatly indebted to you you've done this at no cost to us um, you've demonstrated an expertise that I know since I'm in a similar business cost a lot of money and you haven't charged us anything um, we hope that and by this time next year, we'll have the in-house capability to uh, do these types of analyses. Is if if we can make this higher that we uh, need to make? Can is it reasonable to assume or expect that by next year we could be doing this type of analysis ourselves? I think so. I Good. would suspect so. Um, Avery took the lead on many of these analyses on preparing, drawing down the data files preparing the data for analyses. So I would imagine that somebody at um, beyond a master's level would be able to, to do all that you would need to be able to manage the data and to produce these kinds of reports, particularly with this kind of template that you already have and the questions that you've already formulated because of the analyses that have been done this round and last round you know, you've got a lot more experience now about the things that you need to know and the things that are important to you. And I think that will be really helpful for the person coming in to do targeted analyses. We have what um, I'm pleased to say is a very comprehensive end of the year report that we do where we look at all sorts of performance indicators and performance data, but we would want this to become a regular part of that each year. I think that is important for uh, the school committee, and Chairman Walker knows, and for the viewing public, that um, I think we spent three or four sessions, several hours with you and the whole leadership team. And so um, looking at your work, asking the questions, uh, these really came from uh, the leadership, the principals, and the coordinators, <coughs> and those were questions that are really driving their work. So on behalf of the district, uh, to Mr. Walker, eloquently thanked you. Your expertise, as I said two years ago, uh, Dr. O'Dwyer is a Milton Public School parent. Uh, somebody might be watching and saying, how are we so fortunate? And uh, you also brought the dialogue among the administrators. Um, I told you prior to this meeting, uh, it's under discussion. Uh, they're using your report and really using it to drive instruction and to um, look at our own practices. So I'm very, very appreciative to both of you. Ms. Kelly. Happy to help. Sorry, um, I have uh, one more point to make, and, and that is that my belief is that the school district is our job is to get every student to proficient or above to the best of our ability. Um, it doesn't matter what demographic you you belong to when you walk through our doors. And so when we're doing this comparison of whether if you, if you take out sort of uh, differences and compare, and if we say both programs are, there's not a lot of difference, I guess that's a good thing to be able to say. The question is, like on some of these graphs, I don't know whether this score is a proficient score that we're at after we eliminate it or it's below proficient. And those are the kinds of things and the, the level of detail that I think we need to get to as a system to understand if some of the structure of our system is preventing us from bringing as many children as possible up to profession or above. And that's almost like another step. Right. And I don't want to make this too complicated. I could, do you know what I mean? But uh, um, we have more to do with the data in my opinion. Um, to be able to get us to a place where I think everyone understands um, what's contributing to our um, remaining achievement gaps and how do we help each of those children as quickly as possible get to where they need to be. I would agree with you and I would say compared to last time I presented when there wasn't really a standalone report we focused less on percent proficient and advanced and in this these set of analyses than we did in the previous ones because these analyses went so much further that it just it wasn't feasible to 
look at every possible piece, but there is some stuff in the report about percent proficient and advanced uh, above that. And I would agree with you that there's a whole lot more that's possible. Um, you know, closing the achievement gap, uh, closing differences uh, between the French and the English programs by, through outreach, making the, the groups more comparable. Um, and in addition to all of that, of course, um, improving test scores for everybody across the board. So. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much. Very welcome. Thank you. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. Oh, we don't have a secretary, but uh, all in favor? Aye. <laughs> We're adjourned.